welcome. It is time once again for CU Immigration here on WRFU LP Urbana 104.5 FM. I will be your host for this evening. My name is Mr. Garza, and I'm here to let you know that WRFU is an open forum for the Urbana Champaign community. Views expressed are those of the speakers and are not intended to represent WRFU, UCIMC, Urbana Socialist Forum, or, as we like to say on this show, anyone else. <laughs> no, actually, as we like to say on this show, UPTV. <laughs> fooled you there. Or I fooled myself. I'm not sure which it is. But No, anyway, UPTV. No, uh, whose views are these? Uh, not any of those people's. These views are mine. Me, myself, and I, the three of us, will conspire to offer you views, opinions, thoughts, um, rants, etc. Stuff like that. And in hopes of entertaining, educating, and informing you, if indeed educating and informing are two different things, and I don't necess think they necessarily are, but in this instance, we will count them as two things because I always like things to be in three. Me, myself, and I entertain, educate, inform, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's just a, a rhetorical habit that I've gotten into, and it's hard to break because it, I always feel like I need that third thing, this, that, or the other. And I think it's kind of a classic way to do that sort of thing. Make analogies or whatever. I don't know. Anyway, welcome. Like I said, uh, welcome to the show. Uh, we weren't here last week. Don't remember why not. Oh, I was out of town. And I got back and, you know, weather was terrible. I just didn't feel like doing it. You know, that sort of thing. It's my prerogative. I can do that if I want to, because it's my show. And, but I appreciate it, anyone in the audience who noticed that I wasn't here. If indeed you did. And if you didn't, then, uh, well, you know, you're not as true blue a listener as I would like for you to be, but that's okay. You have a busy life. I know. you got stuff to do. You can't always just be hanging around listening to your radio on Monday evenings and Wednesday evenings and Friday evenings and Sunday, you know, or whatever. Um, but I appreciate when you do tune in. Uh, it's very helpful. Anyway, the show, as you may know or you may not know, is about immigration, hence the name, CU Immigration. Um <clears throat> The name would imply that it's about immigration in Champaign-Urbana only, but uh, everything that happens everywhere in some way affects immigrants who live in or visit or come to or choose to make CU their home. So we don't try to confine ourselves to simply talking about what's going on here in town because there's not that much to say. Uh, occasional immigration raid, yeah. Uh, the occasional rude comment in the, the opinion section of the newspaper or something like that. Certainly there's all that kind of junk which uh, makes for difficult times. But really what's going on here is more a reaction to what's going on nationally and in some cases internationally. So um, I tend to talk about national topics because uh, I know personally from personal experience and through the testimony of people that I know who also do this sort of work that these things uh, have a profound effect on folks that are living here even though they're not necessarily being directly uh, you know forced to, to look this stuff in the face every day. You know, um, it's interesting to think about how these things play out in one's life. Uh, for those of us who are not um, in the crossfire, so to speak, I was born in the United States. I am a citizen of the United States. So I can always look at this and must always look at this from the outside. I mean, I can I deal with it for my friends. I, I feel for my friends. I am affected by my friends and what happens to them. Um, so it's, it is in no way impersonal. 
It's not something that I can just go, oh, well, I'll just tune it out and think about something else. You know, I'm always thinking about it and worrying and losing sleep and going, oh, what's going to happen? You know, uh, but it's, I know that as uh, stressed and as upset as I often am and angry, sometimes just angry about this stuff, it's nothing compared to the people who, whose lives are directly affected. And um, I, wish, I wish there was a way of sharing that um, so it would, would connect with you in some way. I'm, I'm not trying to imply that you, the listener, uh, are somehow uncaring or, or divorced from this topic and, and don't really understand it. But I, I, I'm saying you in the larger, broader sense of the listening audience, the people out there um, who comprise the majority of folks who live in this community. The majority of people who live in this community are citizens of uh, this country. And so they are not as directly affected by what goes on as the people whose lives are being played with. Basically, it, that's what it comes down to. They're being played with. They're being used as pawns in a larger chess game, if I can call it that, by political forces who have found that the immigration is an issue that works for them, that fires up people, it gets them uh, excited, it makes them passionate. And so there are people who are, who control levers of power, who are using the lives of immigrants as a tool to try to get something else that they want. And I have to say this is true for both sides of the aisle. This is Republicans are definitely doing it without a doubt. Not every last one of them, but enough of them that it's a party-wide uh, problem that they must be held accountable for. But there are a lot, enough Democrats that are doing it as well that they need to be held accountable too. Now, you probably think, I can hear the wheels turning in your head right now, and you're saying, oh, he's going to talk about the shutdown and Dems caving on the shutdown and blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah, I am going to get to that. <clears throat> and I suppose I could get to it now since I brought it up at this moment, but that's not where I was really headed with the, those points. My point was just that there is a, a huge difference between how you feel when you read about this. <clears throat> you open your computer or your phone or your newspaper, if you're one of those old-fashioned sorts that reads the news, or a magazine, perhaps, and, um, you know, you read some story about immigration disputes and, and DACA and all these different things. And if you're like most people, you may have a strong reaction to it, but it's not personal. Not in the same way it is if you know, as you read that, that they're talking about you and that they're talking about your future and uh, your security and basically opening and closing or talking about opening and closing doors to you, opportunities and particularly young people. And that's the thing that's just so uh, egregious about this. We're talking young people who are trying, they're having enough trouble just being young. I mean, let's face it, being young is really hard. I don't know if you remember it. I remember it well enough. It was a long time ago, but I remember it well enough to recall that it was it was painful. I mean, that's the only word I can think of for it. It was just painful. It was like, oh, what do I do about this? Where am I going? What's, what's going to happen? And I was one of the lucky ones that knew practically from day one what I was going to do. I had my life all plotted out. I pursued it, you know, step by step. I just went ahead with where I was going to go and what I was going to do. I mean, I had a plan and everything. I I didn't suffer anywhere near the angst that some young people do in terms of like trying to figure out, well, where am I going to go? 
what's going to happen to me? I was just dying to move ahead to the next step. That's what I was into. And I was frustrated that it was taking so long and that there was so much time wasted when I could have been, you know, forging ahead with my career plans and stuff. <clears throat> but imagine yourself in that state, that phase of life, because everybody, I think, at some point uh, faces this question like, okay, what's going to happen to me? Like, Throughout your your early youth, you're going to school. You you know it's the law. You go to grade school. You go to middle school. You go to high school. Blah blah blah. You know, and a lot of people go. Well, the next step stop is college. That's the thing that you do after high school, and then you get out of college and what? Do you get a job? That's right. Everybody, there's you know, it's like this this path that's kind of plotted out for you. You know, you could could be a weirdo like me and go off into the arts and and skip a lot of that stuff um, but f even even if you're doing that you're still like worrying about how am I going to get there how do you get there because it's we see it mostly in the media but just and also just around you know just in your day to day life you're looking around you see people who are doing things you know they have jobs they own businesses they uh, they have careers. They have an identity based around what they do. Like, oh, this person is a doctor. That person uh, is, um, I don't know, a, a worker, a, a, a union worker, a very proud, you know, member of a, a working class who, who does this sort of work. Uh, this person is artistic. Oh, they, they do pottery, you know, or whatever the thing is. You know, you we tend to identify people based around what they do. That's just sort of a standard thing. I don't know, maybe it's true everywhere, but it's certainly true in this country that um, as an adult, your identity is what you do. And that's part of what makes young people, their identity a little harder to like get a hold of because one, you don't even know who you are yet in, in terms of like personal stuff. You're still figuring that out. Plus, your identity is the same as everybody else your age. You're a student. You're a kid. You have parents, or, or maybe you don't have parents, or whatever, but you're a kid. You're sort of a ward of the state, of your family, of the school, of whatever. Uh, you know, you're, you're defined by your age more than by your personality or by your inclination if I can call it that. You know, some kids get started early, they go into sports, or they go, like me, into music, or whatever the thing is, and they, they kind of have this sense of like, oh, I'm special, I'm different, I'm not like these other kids. But most kids don't really have that. They're like students. And they're looking ahead to, I don't know, getting married and having kids, or getting a job, or they might want to own a business someday, or whatever that thing is, but a lot of the, the fun and fantasy of, of being a, a young person is imagining all the, the cool things they could be doing someday if only. You know, like, oh, I could be a secret agent or I could be a movie star. Or I could be, you know, they imagine these various things that they could be. But uh, for most of them, they're not really thinking they're going to be that. They're just like wishing they could be that and kind of have in the back of their mind that like, oh, it, it would be great if that could happen. And since, you know, anything can happen, anything is possible, maybe it will. But they don't really have a path from here to movie star or here to spy or here to, um, you know, astronaut or whatever that thing is. They just imagine these cool things because they see them in the media all the time. And that just seems like that's what I want to be. I want to be that guy in that movie or that uh, person in that uh, music video or whatever the thing is. So that's, those are the people that this stuff is the hardest on because when we're talking about immigration and we're talking about the various points of view that, that are expressed in the news by politicians in particular, uh, th these are serious like, okay, you are either going to be, if this group wins, you're going to have all these opportunities. You could go to college. You could uh, 
start a career. You could uh, build a business. You could be an entrepreneur. You could do all these different things. You know, w one way shows the world open to you, the world that you know, that you're familiar with, that you're living in. And the other way, this other group is like, ah, send them away. These are illegals. We don't want them here. Um, you know, send them back home. And in particular, the DACA kids and the dreamers who are really affected by this kind of uh, brinksmanship that's going on right now about this topic. Uh, and that's what I'm thinking about at the moment, particularly DACA kids. Okay, you, when you signed that, when you signed up for that program, you took a, a huge leap of faith. It's like, okay, I'm going to give my, the government all my stuff. This is dangerous to do, but if I do, all these opportunities are open to me. And then so it's like, there it is. It's like handed to you. Like, okay, you signed on the data line. Here you go. Here's your authorization to work. You were not going to be grabbed by ICE agents every time. You know, you don't have to look over your shoulder. You're okay. And so they get started going for a career. And then all of a sudden, with the, the Trump era, it's like, oh, no, no, we can't have that. Oh, illegals. Nope, can't do it. Got to shut this down. And, and you realize there is a huge, powerful constituency who wants you gone. Simple as that. They want you gone. They don't just want to shut down your opportunities. They want to send you away. They don't want you to even be here anymore. And if you're one of those young people that... Uh, in particular that we're talking about when we talk about dreamers or DACA uh, recipients, this is your country. Every bit as much as it's my country or most of the people listening, they, they, they go, well, yeah, I mean, U.S., I'm a, an American, or however they think of themselves. The dreamers think of themselves that way too for the most part. Uh, they may have some understanding that they have this other heritage that there is also theirs, but that's an extra thing. It's not like an other thing, if I can put it like that. It's not like some separate thing like, oh, well, I'll just, you know, I'll just drop my American hat and I'll put on my whatever hat and I'll be something else. It's not, it's not like that. It's all wrapped up into you. You are, you maybe speak two languages. Maybe you only speak one language. Uh, you may have more than one culture, or maybe you only have one culture. I mean, uh, these people are every bit as much Americans as any of us are, except for that one tiny detail of paperwork. So these are the people right now who are having their lies, lives, not lies, their lives played with by the government. The government is playing with them. The whole... Trump, that, well, I'll get into, I'll read some articles here and, and we'll get into how some of this stuff has happened. But first, let's just, let's just talk about DACA itself because we haven't really gone through what it is and really explained it for a long time. So here's something I dug up called the facts on DACA. And this is from factcheck.org. So it's, you know, pretty basic stuff. So anyway, I'll just read this to you. So Congress is trying to agree on a bipartisan plan on what to do about DACA after the Trump administration announced a wind-down of the program on September 5th, 2017. Lawmakers face a March 5th deadline set by the president to come up with a legislative fix. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell said the Senate could start debate on immigration before February 8th. How does the DACA program work? Here are the facts. First, what is DACA? DACA, the Deferred Action on Childhood Arrivals program, defers deportation proceedings for two years for qualified individuals who were brought to the United States illegally when they were children. The program also gives those who are approved work authorization, and the approvals can be renewed. DACA was created on June 15, 2012, by then-President Barack Obama. So why did Obama create the program? Well, in his 2012 announcement, Obama spoke about the failure of Congress to pass the DREAM Act, which would have provided a path to citizenship for certain immigrants brought to the country as children. He said that an 
the absence of congressional action, the Department of Homeland Security would institute a temporary program to defer deportation for eligible individuals who do not present a risk to national security or public safety. He called it a temporary stopgap measure that lets us focus our resources wisely while giving a degree of relief and hope to talented, driven, patriotic young people. Excuse me. So what were the eligibility requirements? Okay. Applicants to DACA must have or must be at least 15 year old when applying but under the age of 31 as of June 15, 2012. Under the age of 16 when they entered the United States. They have to have been living in the U.S. continuously since June 15, 2007. Present in the U.S. on June 15, 2012 and at the time of applying in school or have graduated or completed high school or have been honorably discharged from the military. And finally, not convicted of a felony, a significant misdemeanor or three or more other misdemeanors. DACA applicants also can't otherwise pose a threat to national security or public safety, according to the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. They couldn't have lawful status on June 15, 2012 either. The requirement that applicants be at least 15, year old, 15 years old when applying is waived for those who are in removal proceedings or had received a final removal or voluntary departure order. They can't, however, be in immigration detention. So what was the process for applying? Well, there is or was a seven-page application that must be submitted along with documentation proving the applicant meets the eligibility requirements, and there's also a form and a worksheet required for employment authorization. The total fee was $495. If the application was in order, USCIS will give applicants an appointment at a local application support center to provide biometric data, including fingerprints, and USCIS will conduct background checks. So how many DACA recipients are currently in the U.S. Well, as September 4th, 2017, there were 689,800 DACA recipients. The total number of people who have ever been approved for DACA since 2012 is 798,980. Nearly 72,000 initial applications were denied. About 70,000 of the cumulative approvals either didn't renew or were, reje were rejected when trying to renew. About 40,000 became lawful permanent residents. There are more people who meet the DACA eligibility criteria. The Migration Policy Institute, a nonpartisan think tank, estimates that 1.3 million met the criteria and could have applied. There are several legislative proposals in Congress to provide a path to legal status for those who came to the United States illegally as children that would apply to larger populations. Okay, so does DACA give recipients legal status in the U.S.? Well, the DACA program didn't provide a path to citizenship, and even though recipients have deportation deferred, they still do not have lawful status. However, about 40,000 former DACA recipients did go on to get their green cards, becoming lawful permanent residents. How? A spokesman for USCIS, Claire K. Nicholson, confirmed to factcheck.org that 40,000 people used what's called advanced parole, under which DACA recipients could get permission, after applying and paying a $575 fee, to travel abroad for humanitarian, educational, and employment purposes. Once they returned to the U.S., they were entering the country legally. Typically, with unlawful status, an immigrant would have to return to his or her home country and apply for a green card there. Those applying for green cards would have to be eligible under one of several categories, including family, such as marrying a U.S. citizen, and employment. So how old are these people? Well, the average age of DACA recipients was 25 years old last year according to a national survey of 3,063 DACA holders in August 2017. The vast majority, 82.5%, were under 30. 
The survey from Tom K. Wong, an assistant professor of political science at the University of California, San Diego, found that when the DACA enrollees arrived in the United States, they were six and a half years old on average, and 54% of them were under the age of seven. Where do they live? Well, the largest concentration of those with initial DACA approvals was in California, 28%, and Texas, 16%, according to USCIS. About 5% of initial DACA approvals came from New York, another 5% came from Illinois, and 4% came from Florida. But there have been DACA recipients from all 50 states, plus the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, Guam, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and the North Mariana Islands. So why did President Trump rescind the program, and when does it end? <clears throat> well, Republican attorneys general and governors threatened legal action against the executive branch if the Trump administration didn't rescind the 2012 DACA memorandum by September 5, 2017. The Trump administration announced a wind-down of the program that day. The memo from the Department of Homeland Security said that Attorney General Jeff Sessions had determined that because DACA was set up through an executive action after Congress rejected legislation on the matter, it was an open-ended circumvention of immigration laws and an unconstitutional exercise of authority by the executive branch. The Attorney General also determined that potentially immigrant litigation against DACA would likely be successful. The Obama administration in November 2014 had expanded DACA eligibility and the period of deferred action to three years, and it created a program called Deferred Action for Parents of Americans and Lawful Permanent Residents, which would defer deportation proceedings for parents with children who were citizens or lawful permanent residents. Those actions were successfully challenged in court by 26 states. A split Supreme Court ruling in June 2016 affirmed an appeals court ruling that halted the 2014 executive action. <coughs> Excuse me. The Trump administration didn't end the original 2012 DACA program immediately. Instead, it said that it would no longer accept new DACA applications and renewals would only be processed for those whose DACA status expires by March 5th. At that point, an average of 915 DACA authorizations would be terminated per day until the final DACA authorization expired in March 2020, according to estimates by the Migration Policy Institute. The administration also isn't approving any new advanced parole requests. However, on January 9th, a federal judge in the U.S. District Court in San Francisco temporarily and partially blocked the Trump administration action, ruling that it had to continue processing DACA renewals while a legal challenge proceeds. It doesn't have to accept new applications. USCIS announced it would abide by that ruling. The administration has appealed the district court decision and said it would request a direct Supreme Court review. So can the Trump administration deport DACA recipients and have any been deported? <clears throat> Under DACA, any deportation action is deferred. However, DACA status can be revoked. USCIS data show that there were 820 terminations in fiscal year 2017 due to convictions or arrests and another 20 terminations related to gang membership or affiliation. USCIS notes that deferred action under DACA does not confer legal status upon an individual and may be terminated at any time, with or without a notice of intent to terminate at DHS's discretion. <laughs> <laughs>